Hey, I'm Alex and you're watching Big Al Books and I'm here today to talk about my favorite books that I read in 2016. It was a pretty good reading year for me. I read around 104 books, two of which were rereads. And even though I had a good reading year, I have never had such an agonizing time trying to decide which books were my favorites. And I'm not exactly sure why that was. Maybe because a lot of the books I read were like very good, but not a lot of them were kind of life-changing all-time favorites. That could be why. So I have been revising my list for a few days now. It honestly keeps changing. I tried to whittle it down to 10 picks. I think I made it to 11 or so. Um, so you know what? We're just going to go with what I have today. It's probably going to change, but here are some of my favorites. All right, so I'm going to start off with Dante's Divine Comedy, which I actually started on January 1st of 2016 and didn't finish until the end of October. So 2016 was the year of Dante for me because uh, it took me 10 months to work my way through this thing, but I'm certainly glad that I did. I took an open Yale course as well. Uh, which is a really great resource in that they post free lectures. So I had a precious Italian professor who helped explain in greater depth a lot of the historical, theological, and philosophical elements to this poem that would have totally gone over my head if I was just reading it on my own. So I definitely learned a lot taking that course and reading this book at the same time. But aside from how much I learned while reading this poem, I was just so amazed by how much fun it could be. I mean, this is an old ass poem, yet it was still really entertaining and engaging. I mean, it's such a timeless story. The idea of this man who gets to travel through the afterlife and report back down to earth on what it was like. I have to say that my favorite part was Inferno, which I read two translations of. This is the Robin Kirkpatrick. Um, but I really have to recommend the Robert Pinsky. It's a newer translation, and it really brought hell to life for me. Um, just the gruesomeness of it, and those like nasty demons that are running around, and the horrible people that are there, and some of the sympathetic people who are there. There's a lot of people there that it's kind of sad when you hear their stories. It does ask a lot of these provocative questions um, about the Christian conception of the afterlife. So there's a lot of interesting ideas um, and it's just an engaging story and there's totally a reason why this is a classic work of literature. All right, so next up, we have a collection of short stories. This is A Manual for Cleaning Women by Lucia Berlin. And she um, wrote these stories quite some time ago, but she basically never got the due that she uh, deserved. She was never appreciated enough in her time. So this uh, collection is an attempt to bring more recognition to her work. What I liked about this collection is that I felt like I really knew Berlin by the end of it. And I think there's a lot of similarities between things that she writes about in her stories and things that actually happened to her in real life. For instance, she was a single mom with four boys, so a single mom with four boys is a, is a character in a lot of these stories. Or um, how she spent time in Mexico and South America. Or all the rampant alcoholism that runs through these stories. I think that was something that she dealt with. So there's a lot of authenticity in her stories, and in that way she reminds me of this cool chick at a bar who's just like telling you about her hard life in this really straight up fashion. And I really appreciate how she brings this working class perspective into literature. Um, you don't often hear a lot about stories about cleaning women or about people who have to kill time waiting at the laundromat or single moms. So I really did like the perspective that she brought in these stories, and I'm excited to revisit them already. So next up on the list, we have The Wake by Paul Kingsnorth, and this novel deals with the Norman invasion of Britain during the year 1066. This novel made my list because I think it's the most formally innovative of the books that I read this year, mainly because it is written in a shadow tongue, as the author calls it. So it is this kind of hybrid of Old English. Um, you don't have to be a scholar to understand it. 
it's not like accurate old English, but it is very disorienting at first. It is a strange sense of grammar and spelling, um, but is a really amazing idea for historical fiction to play with language in that sense because it really took me there. Um, I was really transplanted in the head of the narrator, Buckmaster of Holland is his name, and through the use of that language, I felt like I could totally understand the character and why he was afraid of this invasion. He really views it as a cultural apocalypse and he mourns the loss of his language and of his culture and of his old gods. So you can see what he's fighting for when he forms these bands of rebels to fight the Frenchmen. And I thought it was kind of going to be like Braveheart where they kind of unite and rebel, but it was really a lot darker and more complicated than that because Buckmaster of Holland is a crazy unreliable narrator. So by the end, this book gets really intense and I think it's part of a series, so I can't wait to see what he does next. It's hard to get into at first for sure, but if you get into the Shadow Tongue, the payoff is really worth it in this novel. Next up on the list we have The Noise of Time by Julian Barnes, and this is a fictionalized account of the life of Dmitry Shostakovich. And I was excited about this book because I really admire Shostakovich's music, but I was also worried because uh, it's difficult using fiction to write about real people, and I was hoping Barnes wouldn't take too many liberties, and I wasn't disappointed. I never thought he was being too fanciful in how he imagined Shostakovich, and I felt like he gave a nice depth to his character version of Shostakovich. And mainly this novel is about Shostakovich's kind of complicated relationship with the Soviet Union. So it's kind of a book about how totalitarian governments and artists are completely at odds a lot of the time. Shostakovich sees music as this kind of pure force that is supposed to rise above the noise of time, but sometimes politics interferes. Uh, so it's a really, it's a sad story in a lot of ways, and the book captures a lot of the anxiety of what it was like um, being, a, being a creative force in the Soviet era. One of the interesting things Barnes writes about is how a lot of times we mourn artists who died too young. You know, it's a tragedy, like, who knows what they could have gone on to produce. But in his account of Shostakovich's life, he plays with the idea of maybe some people live too long. And that is also a tragedy, And that Shostakovich feels like the longer that he lives, the more compromised he becomes. He just feels like more of a coward and more of a sellout. And he loses his integrity that he might not have had he died younger. So that was a really interesting idea to me. And it's a really tragic one, you know. Um, so it definitely helped me appreciate Shostakovich's music better. And it was also a beautiful novel at the same time. So next up, we have Beauty is a Wound by Ika Kurniawan. I think I butchered that. I apologize. He is an Indonesian writer whose works are uh, finally getting translated into English, which is amazing because he's a really cool writer. This book has one of the most gripping opening scenes I've ever read, and it is about a prostitute who rises from the grave after being dead for a few years, and she just comes back to life. So I was really gripped right from the beginning, and it never let me down. We learn about the life of this woman, and we also learn about her four daughters, so it has that intergenerational family saga kind of vibe, which I can always get down with. Um, and it covers a, a large span of history as well. So I enjoyed learning about Indonesia. We see the Dutch colonization era. And then we also see Japan invading during the war. So oftentimes the history is really bloody and violent and graphic. Um, this book does not shy away from those elements. But it also kind of has this light fairy tale vibe sometimes. There's definitely magical realism elements. There's also an epic curse that drives the story, which is really great. So it reminded me in a lot of ways of Gabriela Garcia Marquez's um, 100 Years of Solitude, which is one of my favorite books. So this was just a pleasure to read, and I can't wait to read more by this author. 
And speaking of intergenerational family sagas, I definitely have to include Homegoing by Yad Jesse on this list. Uh, this is a powerful collection of linked short stories um, that deal with uh, two lines of the same family. So we start off with two sisters. One of them marries a slave trader and stays in Ghana. The other is taken as a slave and sent to America and we follow their ancestors in each successive chapter until we get to the present day. So this novel does such an amazing job of making the past seem relevant because when you follow these ancestors and these generations, you realize why slavery is still a relevant issue to what's happening today. Um, and my favorite thing about this book was the way that each of these narratives could have been a novel in its own sense. And this book by any other author might have been huge, but uh, Jesse is an incredible editor and gets all these stories in, in under 300 pages. So I loved getting a glimpse into each of these worlds, into each of these characters, but you did only get a glimpse. You'd only have this chapter to see the world through their perspective. But I really found this to be a gripping, compelling uh, debut novel, and I'm excited to see what she does next. So next up we have the complete short stories of Clarice Lispector, uh, who is quite a well-known author in Brazil, but this is the first time that all her short stories have been brought uh, to one volume, so that's pretty cool. I was drawn to this book after I saw the cover, because, you know, she's like a glamorous, interesting looking lady, and I, I have to say I found her writing to have that same kind of mysterious, hypnotic pull. Like, I'm not sure what I enjoyed about it, but I just kept going going back, and you get really enraptured in her stories, which on the surface are kind of about um, people going about their day-to-day -day lives, and then something shifts, and they have these kind of dramatic epiphanies where this subconscious chaos takes over and erupts and completely disrupts their day. So it's about... Um, kind of the two levels of reality. We've got our surface reality, we've got um, the way that we project ourselves, the way we think that our lives are held together, and then there's this like dark undercurrent that is always close to the surface, and anything can trigger it to just have our whole lives fall apart. Um, so, you know, there's like one story about a woman who's just on the bus with their groceries, you know, just any other day, and then she sees a blind guy chewing gum and it just completely throws her off. So they're like mysterious stories like that, that just like challenge the way that we view the world. Very interesting stuff. I am so grateful I found Clarice Lispector this year and I'm excited to dive into more of her novels next year. Our next novel is A Fine Balance by Rohinton Mystery, and this novel's on the list because it was the novel that made me feel the most emotional out of all the books that I read this year. This novel really gutted me. It's a story about four characters who live in India during a rather turbulent time in the 70s. Um, it reminded me a lot of Midnight's Children, which is one of my favorite books. It covers the same period of time, this 1975 emergency, but it does so in a very different way. This is definitely a character-based novel. This is about people and what happens when the political interferes in their everyday lives um, in often really tragic ways. There were multiple, it's a long book, there are multiple points where I where I felt like the plot was kind of like resolved to some degree and I wanted to stop because I knew like it's <laughs> there's gonna be like more sadness coming up like let's just end it here and just be happy and pretend there's a happy ending but I never did stop I kept I kept going I shouldn't have kept going maybe um, it's it's beautiful but it's heartbreaking I cried a lot it wrecked me big time but I'm glad I read this novel I think it's interesting to note that after reading A Fine Balance, I decided to check out Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin, which is also um, known for being a heavily emotional and depressing novel. And while this is probably the best written book that I read this year, I didn't have that emotional connect with it and with the characters and their story. There was just something missing there for me. And I think that could actually be because I was so 
spent after reading A Fine Balance. Like, I maybe had nothing left to give to Giovanni's room. So, read at your own peril. All right, so we're cracking into the top three. So in my top three, I have one novel, one collection of short stories, and one nonfiction book. And the best nonfiction book that I read this year was easily Between the World and Me by Tana Hissy Coates. Between the World and Me is a powerful book um, written in the form of a letter from a father to a son about what it's like to be black in America today. So it's a very challenging book. There's a lot of heavy ideas in here, but Coates' writing is so eloquent and he is such a profound thinker. I found myself copying out pages of this novel while I was reading it. Just he puts things into such clear terms. Honestly, this is a book that I don't really want to talk about too much because it's something that everyone should read. And I really don't say that about many books, but this is short and it is about such a relevant subject, and it is so well written. There's really no reason not to check out Between the World and Me. Next up, we have a collection of stories. This is The Musical Brain by Cesar Ayer, and let's just take a minute to appreciate the cool neon sign cover effect going on here. Um, I read these stories because Patti Smith mentioned them in her memoir, M Train, and my tastes kind of seem to overlap with hers. Like, I like a lot of the same novels that she does. She's such a great woman. Um, and this was no exception. These are wacky stories. Cesar Ayura is a Argentinian writer, and not a lot of his works have been translated to English, but I need to read more of him. I have never felt more like a book was like designed for me, like intended for me to read it because he just did everything with his stories that I would have wanted him to. Like they went in directions that I was so on board with every time and I had such a fun time reading it. So while he's clearly a brilliant writer and he tackles like a lot of heavy concepts, you know, he'll bring God into his stories or like eternity and the infinite, you know, these heavy ideas, but they're always such fun and they go in such unexpected directions. I've just never enjoyed myself as much reading a collection of short stories and honestly I can't even pick out favorite stories from this because I just love them all. So if you're into some wacky shit, definitely give the musical brain a try. And last up, the best novel that I read this year is a Canadian classic, Fifth Business by Robertson Davies. And I'm not sure if it was the novel that I really enjoyed or just the time that I read it. I read this, uh, this is the first part of a trilogy. And I read the whole trilogy this summer while I was at a cottage. So I just have such fond memories of sitting on the dock and unwinding with these awesome books. Um, so that could be a part of the reason that this is ranking up so high on the list. But to be honest, this was just such like a fun, weird novel. This novel is about the life of Dunstan Ramsey, who is one of the most memorable characters I've yet to encounter in fiction. And he's writing this as an older man, so he's got that great curmudgeonly eccentric old man vibe that I love. Uh, but he's also really funny and quirky. Um, and the novel starts at this pivotal moment in his childhood when him and his friend were walking home and his friend threw a snowball at him that had a big chunk of ice in it and Ramsey dodged the snowball but it ended up hitting this pregnant woman in the head and she basically went into labor and kind of lost her mind like she was never the same after getting hit with this snowball so this novel is like about how like this one you know, second of his life changes um, Ramsey and who he is and this guilt that shapes him in the future. Um, and it's interesting, like he ends up being a World War I veteran and you'd think that would be a huge part of his life, but it's just kind of like a casual chapter in this book. And somehow that snowball had more effect on him than the war did, which is strange. The novel introduces the concept of fifth business and Davies explains it as like this fifth character in an opera who they're not one of the main love interests, they're not the villain, they're not all that important, but yet they play this pivotal role in advancing the plot. And this is how Dunstan Ramsey views himself. He sees himself as fifth business, which is interesting because oftentimes we view ourselves um, as the protagonists 
and the heroes in our own stories because that's how our perception works. So here we have a main character of a novel who is narrating a novel, you know, a story of his life and he doesn't even feel like he's the most important character in his life. Like he just feels like he had a part to play in other people's lives, which was a really interesting perspective. The plot of this novel is often pretty rambly, but I just enjoyed Dunstan Ramsey's narration so much that I didn't really care like what was happening or how it unfolded, though it did definitely pick up and build to a really dramatic finish by the end. Um, I can't exactly put my finger on exactly what I liked so much about this novel, the tone or the narration or the characters, uh, but I just had such a great time reading it and I can't wait to revisit it again in the future. Okay, so there you have it. Those were my painstakingly chosen best books of 2016. Um, honestly, I could make this video again next week and it'd be completely different, but whatever. I'm not going to do that again. We're moving on. 2016 is over. Um, <laughs> please let me know in the comments if you read anything amazing this year. And here's to hoping for an even better reading year in 2017. Thanks for watching.